Over the past few years, I've been building a greenhouse on my parents' property with my brother on the weekends. And I wanted to do a little bit more of an explanation. I've uploaded some YouTube videos, and a few years ago I uploaded pictures, photos to Facebook, but never really explained what, what it is I'm doing. So I'm gonna give a, a kind of high-level tour. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what we did before and how we got here. Uh, I'll start with the shed. In in the spot where the greenhouse is right now behind me, we had a we had another greenhouse, um, same size, 20 feet by 30 feet, 600 square feet, and it we learned a few lessons from it. Um, we learned that if you don't paint the PVC ribs and you just leave them as gray electrical conduit, the sun will heat them up, and PVC as it gets hotter it off gases chlorine gas I'm assuming and uh, it will break down the HDPE poly film on top and so we were getting big giant rips in the sides from that and we were taping it it was a maintenance nightmare so we tore that thing down uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second but the goal was to heat in the Minnesota winter attempt to grow plants um, if we just kept a high tunnel uh, it would give us maybe three weeks um, extra in the spring and three weeks later in the fall to to grow beyond the standard growing season um, but uh, uh, kind of the magic is can you grow in the winter and what can you grow in the winter to do that we built the shed and uh, well bought the shed assembled the kit and we built some I don't know if you're gonna be able to see in there there is one of them, uh, Cobb rocket stove. There was three, they're still there. And we would ignite the rocket stove with a microcontroller that would sort of take care of automation. We had this stainless steel basket, um, a diesel glow plug to start wood pellets. And then these, these uh, garbage cans would hold, they'd kind of be like a hopper and they would hold uh, wood pellets, the wood pellets would come down through his head like a toilet flange thing and uh, a little shaker motor would shake those pellets uh, to prevent them from getting stuck on each other and we could keep things burning for hours and we could start it remotely, it was really cool. Unfortunately I wasn't great at putting together microcontrollers with sensors and all the other um, things attached so they would eventually fail from getting burnt out and uh, that caused some of the lines to freeze and ultimately it wasn't it wasn't uh, working out for heating but what we would do is we would we would uh, heat on top of the the rocket stove would be a heat exchanger from like a, a car a heater core and we would heat a 55 gallon barrel drum insulated back there and um, we would run water underground. I don't know if there's still... Yeah, we'd have these insulated lines coming from underground that would go to the greenhouse, come back up, and then heat the air. Water would circulate back. And that was pretty cool. Uh, having that is our first go around we wanted to be a little more reliable so we ended up buying a, a just a basic wood pellet stove that has its own built-in thermostat it's not very controllable um, if i had to do that again i would buy buy one that i had more control over but uh, we were able to heat the next season just fine with wood pellets um, we wanted to keep some of the costs down so we're going to use that same model to heat this winter, but we changed the greenhouse style. This is a greenhouse in a greenhouse. The inner footprint is still 20 feet by 30 feet, and the outer, it's literally a separate greenhouse uh, with its own set of ribs um, that is 24 feet by 34 feet, giving us uh, roughly 22, 22 inches of... Uh, a gap between the two greenhouses and we're gonna fill this up with bubbles liquid bubbles um, in each of the four corners is a drain and 
in the center of this walkway it's kind of it's at its high point so half of the bubbles will drain down that way half will drain down this way and you can see it, it's the complete perimeter all around this greenhouse uh, we had to level the land here so we built a uh, what is a sandbag wall retaining wall with chicken mesh and uh, or chicken wire and lime and sand um, plaster I've seen lime and sand and clay work as an external um, wall but I don't know if if I got bad lime or the mixture was off but this thing crumbled after one season so i um, gonna have to get get to figuring out what to do next here because those sandbags will break down from the Sun pretty quick anyway in the center of the greenhouse is this backbone the spine that goes down even in the middle and it partitions the greenhouse into two spaces and the the reason being is that in the winter you might want to just keep the north wall which is what this wall is filled with bubbles during the day uh, those bubbles will act as an insulation and reflect some of the low-lying Sun back into the greenhouse as you're not going to get any usable Sun coming from the north and during nights we could fill up both sides and keep the heat inside they say so there's a, the, a group of people called Sola Roof, S-O-L-A Roof, that I don't know if they invented this concept, but I definitely stole some of my ideas from them. Um, uh, overall of just doing liquid bubbles as an insulation. And they claim roughly that one R, one inch of bubbles is equivalent to one R value. In a typical greenhouse, hoop house, high tunnel, uh, you'd use you, you'd use a style that is just one set of ribs and uh, a double poly inflated setup, which gives you I think like 0.7 R, which is a lot better than just one layer of plastic. But 22 R potentially is what we're talking about, and that's that can be higher than houses. So it'll be really interesting to see this winter what what the efficiency gain is when we keep those bubbles running. Let me talk a little bit about the bubbles. It kind of all starts with the air. There is on this half of the greenhouse a fan and on that half of the greenhouse a fan. This is a 12 inch fan that gets uh, um, directs air down into a six inch set up and then a, another six inch tube here and out of the very top of the greenhouse is a corrugated tube that has a bunch of holes in it and we're pulling air from there sucking it into the fan and then pushing it back up into the lower tube which pushes through the bubblers there's four of those bubblers per side eight total and the reason we set it up like this is because on a smaller scale model we built um, we would pull air from the outside and then fill up the the greenhouse and when you take external air and introduce it into a chamber without any uh, without getting rid of that pressure it it builds up to the point where it blows up so in, in this it's theoretically going to stay equalized because we're pulling and pushing air from the same chamber um, for the water the water starts in a 55 gallon barrel drum down here this two-thirds filled with kind of a liquid soap solution is um, is enough liquid to create bubbles on one half of the greenhouse it's just a standard 55 gallon barrel drum on the bottom is a bulkhead so that I can attach a second one which is all the capacity I will need to keep both sides inflated during the winter um, the bubbles are made out of uh, sodium lauryl sulfate which 
is a very, very mild detergent found in most shampoos. And uh, apparently it's not terrible for the environment if, heaven forbid, there was a spill or some of it got on the grass. So um, I felt like it was a safe option for soap. And then the, the pump down there pulls water out of the 55 gallon barrel drum, pushes it up into this blue tube, which isn't hooked up to, this isn't hooked up yet, but um, it connects into this pressure tank with some valves, one-way valves and, and shut off valves and stuff. And that acts as a buffer so we don't have to run the pump constantly. And then it pushes into the red tube, red hose, three quarter inch hose, goes underground, comes up here into two solenoid valves, which can be controlled by a microcontroller. And I can open up one side at a time, which introduces the liquid on this kind of bottom PVC bar here, which is then routed up into each of the bubblers. Therefore, completing the two elements required for bubbles, air and water, or air and soap. Uh, the, the nozzles on the bubblers are two gallon per minute nozzles, which makes a mist, a spray. And the pump it gives between 30 to 60 PSI. Um, so you end up with this spray mixture hitting a filter material and air forcibly going through that and it just creates a bunch of bubbles, which I'll show in a moment here. As those bubbles fill up the chamber, they fill all the way to the top and then we will be shutting off the bubbles and then on some interval of maybe 10 or 20 minutes, turning them on again for a short time just to keep the side inflated throughout the evening. As morning comes around, we then just let the bubbles naturally pop and die off. They last quite a while, they last hours. So it is no problem keeping the bubbles filled here. It's not like we're trying to keep up. They will pop and then drain into the drain, which comes down here from all four sides and they fill this, this up. So closed loop circuit. In the spring or during heavy rains, the water level rises above that of the bottom of the pit. So I installed a, under this mess of pumps and cords and stuff, I installed a sump pump um, reservoir and a, a sump pump down there. And that pumps up through the black tubing underneath the side of the greenhouse and it goes down into a grass area. Runs along the side here underground, goes over here, and then somewhere in this mess of weeds comes back up and we can get rid of any extra water. Nice thing about that is it kind of doubles as a, a wastewater um, system automatically because if we wanted to, for example, have a sink or just get rid of water for some reason, we can also dump it down this tube which fills up the sump area and gets rid of the water so kind of dual action there which is pretty cool. Uh, I wired some power electrical 110, 120 volt boxes in each of the four corners and on the poles and have some power going up for lights and then one in the pit to keep the pumps running. There's also an air compressor that will help clear out the lines uh, after we're done pumping water. So you might think in the winter, I mean, things get really cold in Minnesota below, below zero degrees, right? And you might think water would freeze eventually. And I think you're right. I, I'm not sure if there's enough air in the, in the tubing just considering the how not everything is straight it's kind of all over the place up there but um, I wanted to remove that variable from the equation so I can spray air through the water line 
and I can spray air through the sump pump line to get rid of all water using that compressor. And I can do that because one-way water valves will prevent air from going back into the pumps and uh, going the opposite direction. So that's pretty neat. This is the air intake and I'm going to have the mechanism that I can automatically open and close that air intake. I haven't set it up yet, but I do have it. it just needs to be installed. So that's the idea. Um, I wanted to do other things like geothermal. I had a contractor come out and give me a bid on what it would take to bring his excavator out and dig up some of the land. Uh, it's not my land and my parents didn't want tractors all over the place, so that was not an option here. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens this winter when we try to keep it heated with wood pellet stove, liquid bubbles, and microcontrollers to help automate the whole thing. I'll continue to show the progress as we go, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.